Good evening, I'm Andrew Cheng. And I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, teachers get candid about their own classroom stress. If I could find a window out of the public education system right now, I would jump. The impact of COVID-19 in our schools. He says, let's talk about the last moments of your wife and your daughter. Flight 752 loved ones say they're under threat for speaking out. Almost everything he's ran on, he's done. Well, not quite. A check-in on the U.S. president's promises. And ocean researchers can't believe it. I have never seen such an amazing seafood. A newly discovered piece of the Great Barrier Reef. This is The National. Tonight, we tackle COVID-19 in ways we can all relate to. Put aside for a moment the direct threat the virus might pose to you. And think of how its impact has radiated outwards, affecting really important aspects of your life. It's taken away a physical outlet that helps with mental balance. It has filled many with dread at the state of their loved one's care and anger at the lack of it. For some of the most vulnerable workers, it's brought exploitation and abuse. And in the classroom, mounting stress, both real and virtual. But let's consider it from the teacher's point of view. More than 2,000 of them responded to a questionnaire sent out by CBC News. And Deanna Sumanak johnson shows us their messages that come across as an SOS. Lisa Levitan has wanted to be a teacher since she was a child and has now taught for 16 years, but nothing could have prepared her for the stress of teaching during the pandemic. The workload is never ending. There's no time to breathe this year. There's no time to prep. As a union steward in her school, she's also heard from colleagues. They're not eating. They're not sleeping. They're very overwhelmed. Levitan is one of 2,065 teachers of all grades from the Atlantic provinces and the Ottawa region who answered a CBC News questionnaire about teaching during the pandemic. Their answers suggest they're burnt out just over a month into the school year. The teachers we heard from told us their mental and physical health tops their list of concerns, with one-third considering leaving the profession or retiring. I, I love being an educator, but I don't feel like that's what I'm doing right now. This was true even for respondents from Nova Scotia, a province that has had low infection numbers. I feel like I'm a COVID rule enforcer, and if I could find a window out of the public education system right now, I would jump. Those COVID rules, like distancing, could be behind the stress. With three quarters of teachers who replied saying that keeping social distance from students in class was not possible very often or not at all. In a statement, the spokesperson for the Ontario Minister of Education, Stephen Lecce, said the Ministry of Education provided health and safety training for all school board staff. One day was specifically dedicated to mental health and well-being. And conversations about stressed teachers are important to have because they affect students too, says this developmental psychologist. Essentially, they're not able to uh, transfer and uh, those feelings of safety onto the students. And the reason why that's important is because uh, without that, learning is not really possible. In a year where the education system is facing test after test, the thousands of responses show it's failing some of its teachers physically and mentally. Tiana Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. And we are going to dig deeper into the risks of being in a bricks and mortar classroom. And if you've ever wondered, are schools perhaps safer than we thought? We'll stick around to hear from two infectious disease doctors a bit later on that. Canada's public health agency put out official numbers today on the death toll from COVID-19 in long-term care homes and reinforced the measures needed to protect residents. It's in the screening uh, um, every day of uh, anyone who enters facilities rapidly testing people who are uh, ill and doing widespread testing if there's an outbreak. As of August 21st, roughly 80% of COVID-related deaths occurred in long-term care homes. That's just over 7,200 lives lost. Two-thirds of them in Quebec, more than a quarter in Ontario, and then a big drop to 153 deaths in Alberta, 145 in B.C., 57 in Nova Scotia. 
So we've always known people in these homes are at incredible risk. And you heard Dr. Tam there mention some of the measures needed to protect them. But at Manitoba's biggest and deadliest outbreak, safety measures fall short. Jillian Kubra has that. Albert Lee's mother died just weeks after moving into Parkview Place, and he's still shocked at what happened. She wasn't isolated. He's learned that the care home didn't separate her from her roommate after his mother tested positive. Instead, their beds were pushed apart and end tables put between them. It's time to revamp the health care industry because I don't think it should be an acceptable practice. His mother, Pak Lee, died October 6th. The Winnipeg Regional Health Authority says it's working to keep positive patients together, but acknowledges the virus has spread to most floors of the 12-story building. Crowding within rooms and shared roommates is a risk factor. Dr. Nathan factor Stahl studied the impacts of the virus in long-term care homes during the first wave of the pandemic in Ontario. Almost a third, 31% of all deaths could have been averted if uh, care home residents were all in single rooms as opposed to double or four person rooms. He says if there's not enough room to house residents individually, barriers can be put up and jurisdictions should consider alternatives like hotels or stadiums. Lee wants Manitoba to take over management of the for profit care home run by Rivera. Why aren't they learning the lessons from uh, the neighboring provinces and taking action on those? Rivera says it's bringing in more staff and testing all residents. The health minister says there's no plans to take over Parkview Place, although nothing is off the table. In a statement, the minister says, Our government has been diligently preparing since the beginning of this pandemic. We believe that our early interventions and actions have prevented further negative outcomes. Little consolation for Lee. His family celebrated his mother's life last week virtually. The teacher, mother, and restaurant owner died just shy of her 103rd birthday. Jill Kubra, CBC News, Winnipeg. Now, Manitoba won't go there yet, but Ontario has ordered new management at a privately run care home. Millennium Trail Manor in Niagara Falls is now being run by the Regional Health Authority there. The province says this is a temporary measure to control an escalating number of cases, but no one will say how many there are. As work life has come into the home for so many Canadians, some families have counted on migrant care workers to help them through. But now, some of those workers say the pandemic is being used against them and they're looking for protection. Magda Gabrasalasa has the details. Overworked, underpaid, caring for the young and old in private homes. Today, already vulnerable migrant care workers, now under pressure in a pandemic, spoke out. I was working from 7.30 in the morning to 7 p.m. and watching the kids, but I keep being paid same as before. I was exhausted. It feels very sad. This woman shared what happened with her last employer with advocacy groups. From July to September, they carried out a small survey. About 200 of Canada's 25,000 workers responded. Mostly racialized women filled out a survey sharing their experiences of abuse, exploitation, fear, and stress. They did so by text, social media, and emails. Advocates were troubled by what they heard. Employers are also refusing to let workers leave the homes because of COVID-19. Now it's calling for the government to protect these workers, including making them permanent residents now. Harpreet Kaur says she applied late last year and is still waiting. Meanwhile, her work permit will soon expire. That is why I am scary right now. When my work permit expires, my health card will also expire. This academic says there's a power imbalance between employers and migrant workers. That can only be fixed by giving permanent resident status to essential workers. And this means workers in all sorts of industries and employment environments. The government says it's committed to fixing some unacceptable gaps brought to light by the pandemic, saying that includes considering new pathways to permanent residents. Mark de Gebrasalasa, CBC News, Toronto. So let's take a look at some of the latest pandemic data now, starting with just the raw numbers, but then I'm going to show you something. So 
In BC, 287 cases, 410 in Alberta, Manitoba's surge continues with 170 and with much higher numbers, Ontario and Quebec with 834 and 929 respectively. But let's try that again, taking population into account. The numbers from Health Canada this week on a per capita basis, as you can see, Manitoba leads Canada in rates of infection, more than 1,600 active cases per million people, followed by Alberta and Quebec with more than 1,000 each, then Saskatchewan and Ontario, each having around 500 cases per million people. Now, gyms and fitness centers are often cited as places that explain those climbing numbers with thousands ordered closed at one time or another. But as Cameron McIntosh explains, many owners and users fiercely disagree with some facilities now closed, demanding they be allowed to reopen. Kicking, punching, sweating. Before COVID, lunch hours here were packed. Today, it's just one client in Tim Ewan's kickboxing gym. We've definitely dropped our membership. Still, he'll take it over shutting down again. So you're just hanging on, basically? I'm hanging on, yeah. And yeah, that's, you know, just making people aware that we are still available here. For now, at least, Manitoba is letting Winnipeg keep its gyms and recreational facilities open. The type of treatment the industry is pushing for in Toronto and across Quebec, where gyms have been shut, arguing it's providing health benefits during a health crisis as revenues sink to 60% pre-COVID levels across a $4 billion industry. It'll be really, really hard for them to make it through um, the next couple of months, never mind the next couple of weeks. Protests are planned tomorrow in Quebec. Good Life is asking Ontario members to write their MPPs. Toronto's mayor is pushing for a compromise. I think there can be a way found where in uh, certain circumstances, subject to certain conditions, uh, we could have uh, gyms reopen. But Ontario is standing firm. We have been advised by public health doctors that that is a place where uh, transmission is happening. I don't think you can make a universal statement about gyms being unsafe. You have this physical literacy to... expert says it should come down to the facility. If the gym is a crowded gym, I wouldn't be going to it. If it's a gym that allows adequate spacing with good ventilation, the risks are relatively low. Ewan, meanwhile, has invested in state-of-the-art sanitation mapped out precisely where people can work out. Having a physical activity there uh, is important to, you know, reduce that stress and anxiety. People are finding ways during the first months of the pandemic. A Stats Canada survey found that indoor and outdoor exercise actually increased. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Now a sliver of upbeat news today from the Canadian retail sector. Dozens of David's Tea locations are set to reopen. The Montreal-based tea shop was hit hard by COVID-19 and did go into bankruptcy protection. It shut down about 200 locations and shifted to online sales. But now some 45 stores will reopen under a new chain called Tea Kettle. The company says it'll employ about 250 people. Now to COVID-19 in the U.S. More than half a million Americans contracted coronavirus in the last seven days. That's the highest week-over-week -week total yet. Six days before the election, that detail caught the attention of the candidates. We're on an upward slope of a bigger wave of confirmed infections than anything we experienced to date. We got to get back to normal, but you got to open up the stairs because we understand it now. We understand it. People are getting better. So far, more than 75 million votes have already been cast in the 2020 election. That is more than half of the total votes cast in 2016. Now, the candidates have more than COVID on their minds. They're also talking about the violence in Philadelphia following the latest police shooting of a black American. There is video and audio of that moment, and it is disturbing. And so a caution, we will show you part of it in Stephen D'Souza's story. For the last two nights, protesters have marched through Philadelphia, while looters have run unchecked. The anger and violence fueled by the death of Walter Wallace Jr. Today, stores were boarded up and residents picked up the pieces. This is not the way to display your anger towards what's going on. At least 30 officers have been injured, dozens of people arrested. Yo, crazy on me. New video shows the shocking final moments of Wallace Jr.'s life. Police confronted him on Monday. He had a knife and a history of mental illness. 
The two officers fired 14 times. Police say Wallace Jr. refused to drop the knife. His family was watching. They say they called 911 for help for a mental health crisis. Unfortunately, the officers were not equipped with A, the training, or B, the proper equipment. The mayor today promised 911 calls and body camera footage will be released in the near future. Walter Wallace Sr. called for answers and calm. I don't condone no violence, tearing up the city, looting up the stores, and all this chaos going. The shooting and its aftermath comes during a heated presidential election in which Donald Trump has used images of violence and looting on American streets to motivate his supporters. A Democrat-run state, a Democrat-run city, Philadelphia. We don't have that. We don't have it. The Republicans don't have it. There is no excuse whatsoever for the looting and the violence. None whatsoever. Residents promise the protests will continue. We protested for George Floyd. You better believe we're going to protest for our own citizen of our neighborhood. The city has imposed a curfew, setting the stage for another tense night on Philadelphia's streets. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. President Trump is facing backlash today after seven people were taken to hospital following his rally in Nebraska last night. He gets his photo op and he gets out. He leaves everyone else to suffer the consequence of his failure to make a responsible plan. Hundreds were stranded in the freezing weather for hours following the Trump rally, waiting for buses to take them back to their cars. The Trump campaign blamed local road closures for the delays. So this epic electoral choice facing Americans is now six days away, but they'll also be voting in local races, consequential, sure, but not national. It's there, though, where you will see a diverse new generation of candidates. Katie Simpson explains why they're putting their names on a ballot. As a Democrat in Delaware, Sarah McBride is popular enough that supporters pull over to say hello. I voted for you in the primary. She is expected to win her race in a run fit for history books. If all goes as predicted, she will become the first transgender person elected to a state Senate. I am mindful of the powerful message that this election can send to a young person here in Delaware or really anywhere else in this country, um, that our democracy is big enough for them too. Thank you so, so, so much for coming out. McBride is part of a record number of LGBTQ candidates on ballots this year. An analysis done by an advocacy group called the Victory Fund found more than a thousand members of the community are running in local, state and federal elections up 41 percent from 2018. I think the record number of LGBTQ people is certainly a byproduct of our progress, but it's also a reflection of the fact that the current presidential administration at every turn has sought to attack the rights and dignity of LGBTQ people. Black Lives Matter! The Trump administration and the current political climate have inspired candidates from diverse communities to take a run at higher office. Black women are leaning into our political power in this cycle, um, because we are trying to build a democracy we can all believe in. It's a record year for black women candidates, an all-time high 130 black women are running for Congress, 98 Democrats and 32 Republicans. Christina Henderson, I'm Christina, I'm running for at-large. Christina Henderson is running to be a city councillor and is open to considering a run for Congress in the future. I feel like a part of it is building the bench and a lot of that starts with local races. Are you supporting black women who are running for local offices so that you can have a bench for folks to run for Congress, for Senate and those kinds of things? Building bench strength is one way to change the representation gap, Henderson hopes, so that the halls of power better reflect the people they serve. I'm going for the young people this time. So. I appreciate you. God bless. You. Katie Thank Simpson, you. CBC News, Washington. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Well, nearly 10 months after Iran's Revolutionary Guard shot down a Ukrainian airliner, their loved ones are still waiting for answers. 55 Canadians and 30 permanent residents were on that flight. But instead of explanations, a growing number of families say what they're getting lately are threats. Ashley Burke has that story. It's just insulting, all of them. And again, and again. Bad enough for Hamid Ismailian to have lost his wife and daughter killed on flight 752. But now he has a painful new task. Traitor. Tracking hateful messages that he shares with police after receiving this death threat online. 
Your name is on the list of terror. So enjoy your life before you get killed. Messages he believes are coming from people in Iran, but also from inside Canada. All because he's been vocal demanding answers as a spokesperson for the families who lost loved ones on the plane. Are they agents? Is it the cyber army? For months he's been harassed online. But the situation escalated after this rally on Parliament Hill. A suspicious vehicle parked outside his house north of Toronto. Then came a call. He says, let's talk about the last moments of your wife and your daughter. Yeah, that, that is. Others are also receiving threats that appear to be coming from Iranian authorities. Mahmoud Zibai also lost his wife and daughter. He received a call purportedly from an Iranian investigator. I can uh, regard it as a threat. He kept telling me that... Uh, okay, we have to we have to see each other. Javed Salamani lost his wife. He's also been sharing threats with Canadian authorities, and he thinks there has been some action. They informed us actually they removed at least one of those people supporting the Iranian regime from the Canada. Authorities are now aware of almost a dozen cases and are working with local police, security organizations, and international allies to take action. These are. Uh, ugly, insidious uh, crimes, uh, apparently orchestrated at the, at the behest of, uh, uh, of a foreign power. Uh, and that, uh, that is something that would be disturbing to every Canadian. Ismailion says it won't deter him from speaking up and seeking the truth. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, former Alberta MP and Cabinet Minister Don Mazankowski has died. The longtime Conservative MP served in Parliament for 25 years, including a stint as Deputy Prime Minister under Brian Mulroney. Today, MPs marked his passing in a moment of silence. Mazankowski was named an Officer of the Order of Canada in 2000. He was 85 years old. Well, France has announced another national lockdown, but it's not the only European country facing new restrictions. We are all in this together. Up next, how Europe is trying to contain the virus this time around. Plus, from promises to reality. I will never, ever let you down. We'll have a look at Donald Trump's record four years in. And later, a discovery larger than the Empire State Building. Nobody knew that this was here. What researchers found underwater. We're back in two. Australia's second largest city has emerged from nearly four months of lockdown. Melbourne's restaurants, cafes and bars reopened on Wednesday. Meanwhile, Europe continues to account for nearly half of new cases globally. And today, there was action in many countries. France took the most drastic, but then it is averaging 40,000 new infections a day. That's where Renee Filipponi begins her look at a continent facing a crisis. An air transfer of a COVID patient in France illustrates how serious the situation is as hospitals start to fill up yet again. Tonight, in an address to the nation, President Emmanuel Macron ordered a second nationwide lockdown. I have trust in us, in you, trust in our capacity to get through this challenge, he said. All non-essential businesses will be closed starting Friday, but schools will stay open. Anyone leaving their home will need signed documentation. It's an emotional roller coaster, says this man. I'm a bit sad, but I can still understand. Germany is also taking a new hard line today. The country avoided the worst of the pandemic's first wave, but officials say it's beginning to lose control and are ordering a partial lockdown. These are tough measures we agreed on, and they are burdensome, says Chancellor Angela Merkel. Like France, all bars and restaurants will be closed for one month, and people are urged to avoid unnecessary travel. Deaths across the continent rose nearly 40 percent in a week, a worrying number for the European Commission presidents. We are all in this together. No member state will safely emerge from the crisis until everyone does. But some restrictions are sparking protest. In Rome, there were clashes with riot police as Italy hit a new daily record of 25,000 cases. And the Spanish government is sending a message. This may go on for some time, extending its state of emergency for six months. 
el 9 de marzo y segunda revisión. It will be reviewed on March 9th and then again in May, says Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez, who hopes this move will help stop the contagion curve, a goal shared across Europe and most of the world right now. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Things are getting worse in Russia as well, especially in regions outside the major cities. As Chris Brown found out, and as you're about to see, crowding at healthcare facilities is just the start. It gets much more grim than that. The horror stories about COVID-19 ravaging rural Russia are hard to watch. This video shows dozens of corpses in the basement of a hospital in the Siberian city of Novokuznetsk. It was arguably worse in Barnaul Hospital number 12. One of the bodies left out like that was Artemy Pachenko's aunt, Ludmila. He says by the time doctors told him and he got her body back 10 days later, it was bloated and unrecognizable. We were hoping it would be more civilized, that her body was refrigerated somewhere, not just left like this on the floor. Maria Sertsevo got COVID and, in a social media post, said she was turned away from a Barnaul hospital. Incredibly, doctors told her to go home and to blow into a balloon to strengthen her lungs. One of the worst stories has come out of Rostov-on-Don, where 13 patients on ventilators died when the hospital there ran out of oxygen. Today, two senior administrators were fired. This doctor and professor says he sees little relief for rural Russia's cash-starved healthcare system. Uh, in general, in Russia, things are going to worse, um, but on, on what a scale, uh, it is difficult to uh, estimate. As for Russia's much-hyped vaccine, Sputnik V, it's still in stage three trials and slower at generating data than some of its Western competitors. But the promises about how it will soon save the country continue. We will administer the vaccine to 70 percent of the country, and within 10 to 12 months, Russia will make this disease vaccine manageable, said its creator, Alexander Ginsberg. In the meantime, there's a frantic effort to find beds. In hard hit Barnaul, that even means converting a shopping center into a COVID ward. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. Well, when we come back, we revisit the well-being of kids and teachers in schools. And we'll ask the question, is it possible we've taken restrictions too far? Hear from our panel of doctors. And from the border wall to the Supreme Court, did Donald Trump deliver on his big promises? That's coming up. I'm not going to quit my job. I'll never quit my, my students. I love them. I need to be with them and I love what I do, but I don't know if I'm going to make it the year. And quite frankly, I don't know any teacher who does. Welcome back. That's Lisa Levitan, who we heard from earlier in the program. She's a teacher in Ottawa who is struggling. Safety restrictions, physical distancing and virtual learning have all forced a major recalibration of how schools work in this country. So. Let's talk about what's working and what's not working. Join me now, infectious disease specialist, Dr. Suman Chakrabarti and Dr. Lenora Saxinger. Hello to the both of you. Dr. Uh, Saxinger, <coughs> maybe I'll start with you because physical distancing, I mean, that, that's one thing that came up over and over again as something that's not working. A majority of teachers who you know, reached out to us telling us that kids aren't actually able to maintain physical distance at all times. What's your reaction to that? I'm not really surprised by that. I think that earlier on, we did see a lot of European and other jurisdictions that went back to school before us and had earlier epidemics where um, they used really you know, stringent measures and like do circles on the ground for the children to stay in. And they really found it unworkable. And a lot of places seem to have walked back that part of it. I think partly because it's not been clearly shown how much it adds to protection in that setting. And also because it's kind of unenforceable. and. I think there's a lot of stress associated with having kids have to change their behavior that much versus other measures like symptom screening and cohorting and things that also can reduce risk. Right. So, so Dr. Chakrabarty, maybe you can, you can help me understand something here. So take a look at this. So this is data that we have from the Ontario government uh, as of this morning. So of nearly 5,000 public schools in the province, more than 4,000? have not had a single confirmed coronavirus case. And, and of the schools that do have cases, it's almost never more than one, two, or, or three cases. So 
in my mind, I'm trying to process that, and, and that sounds to me like, in a way, it's, it's an infection control success story, right? But it sort of begs the question, I mean, was, I don't know, was the threat in schools overblown? This is the public health and preventative paradox. When you look at the situation, you know, if you have a successful preventative campaign for public health, the result is nothing happens. Now, that's not to say that the, these preventative measures are perfect. Of course, there are going to be cases. And unfortunately, I, we will see, you know, the occasional more school closure. But for the most part, with the hard work of our teacher colleagues as well as the students themselves, things seem to be going okay. And there's a precedent for that. We saw that in other countries as well in Europe. So this is a good start, but there's still a lot more of school year to go. But can we say then defini definitively that it, it sort of the infection rate in schools isn't what's driving infections in the community, that, that what, it's it sort of flipped? Although we are seeing more transmission um, across communities across Canada, um, here like quite severely actually, the contribution of schools appears to remain very small, um, as my colleague said, with really small case numbers per listed outbreak as well. So uh, I think that the picture that's evolving really is that schools are not driving trans transmission, but they kind of mirror what's happening in the community more so. Mm. Okay, uh, Dr. Saxinger, here's the, here's the question for you that we received from Brindley Fellows, a student in Toronto. Have a listen. I was wondering what you think we can expect next year to look like in terms of in-person and online learning. <laughs> and, and that's a decision that, that both students and parents will have to sort of face and, and constantly reevaluate. So what's your answer there? Well, I mean, I, I think none of us have a crystal ball, but the features that we're going to be looking for are the experience over the rest of the fall and winter, um, what happens with school openings and closures, and actually, importantly, whether or not we can actually start getting to the question of which of the protective measures are the most high-yield ones. Um, and how we can try to continue to normalize the school experience if possible and still maintain safety for kids and teachers. So the third thing will be whether or not there's a vaccine available, which might happen partway through um, like the second quarter or later of 2021. And that would also really change the way that we look at the risks. So I think it's gonna be really dynamic and uh, the full span of possibilities is still open as far as I, I can tell. Right, so, so clearly a tough question to answer, but Dr. Dr. Chakrabarty, what, what if I put it to you this way? What if you had to answer that question now? I mean, is, is it a better idea to put your kid in class in a physical environment or do the virtual learning, given what we know about the infection rate in schools? I think looking at it now, you know, I would I would have been comfortable at the beginning as well with my own kids. Uh, but I, I think that right now we're seeing that again, the the infection rate has not exploded in the schools. I'm not saying that it can't later on, but I think that right now it's safe. I think that also in-person learning is such an important part of our children's development. So I would want my kids to be in class. Things might change in a couple of months, but for right now, that's how it, I would answer. But how would you then, let me ask you this, how would you improve things? Because Dr. Saxinger has, has made the point in a couple different ways that, that there are a whole lot of different vectors, right? And, and physical distancing is, is just one of them. So knowing what we know, what would you fine tune about, uh, I don't know, the way we, we control infections in schools going forward? That's a really good point. I think the thing that is what actually can we relax, as Dr. Saxinger was saying, because I think that there are things that are making school very unenjoyable, no extracurricular activities. But if you look at these things, you might see that some extracurricular activities might be just as safe as they were before. And, you know, reintroducing can bring some of that enjoyment back. Maybe we can have a bit of a bigger class size if you have good ventilation. Doctors, uh, wonderful to talk to you and, and wonderful to learn from you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Indeed. And after the break, putting Donald Trump's record to the test. How the U.S. president's promises hold up four years later. Plus. We're finding a reef as tall as the Empire State Building or the Eiffel Tower. A surprise discovery in the Great Barrier Reef. We'll be right back. And next year will be the greatest economic year in the history of our country. We will deliver record prosperity, epic job growth, and a safe vaccine is coming very quickly. Okay, some flashy campaign promises today from Donald Trump, who made his pitch in Battleground, Arizona, six days before Election Day. It's hardly unusual for first-term president to campaign on a record of promises delivered, suggesting more of that in a second term. But when it comes to Donald Trump and his promises, where do things stand? Paul Hunter has a look. 
President-elect of the United States, Donald John Trump. On the day he was sworn in as president, Donald Trump reminded Americans of the promises he'd made that got him there. I will never, ever let you down. His to-do list was a lengthy one. We will bring back our jobs. We will bring back our borders. We will build new roads and highways and bridges. A new national pride will stir our souls, lift our sights, and heal our divisions. And while he didn't say, I guarantee it, he sure came close. Now arrives the hour of action. America will start winning again. There's nothing wrong with America. So now jump ahead nearly four years and where Trump backers made their view clear on the president. Promises made, promises kept. He does what he says he's going to do. So that's what I like about him. But is that true? To put it to the test, why not start with the big one, or as Trump so often put it, the big, beautiful one? I will build a great, great wall on our southern border, and I will have Mexico pay for that wall. Mark my words. Short answer, he did not. In fact, replacement fencing aside, the wall under Trump has grown less than 30 kilometers, and it was paid for by the U.S., not Mexico. Nonetheless, in taking on illegal migration, Trump did crack down on those who'd crossed in and in so doing left many children separated from their parents, hundreds of whom now cannot find their parents. Another biggie for Trump, manufacturing jobs. Even as president, he had a promise for factory workers facing tough times in Ohio. Don't sell your house. Don't sell your house. We're going to get those values up. We're going to get those jobs coming back. And we're going to fill up those factories or rip them down and build brand new ones. So it's going to happen. But less than two years later, the plant closed. And while there are plans to reconfigure it, the jobs have moved elsewhere. Overall, under Trump, manufacturing jobs did go up, but only at the same pace as under Barack Obama. And when COVID struck, that growth collapsed. Then there's health care. We will repeal and replace disastrous Obamacare. It has not been repealed or replaced, and Trump has yet to make public his health care plan. Indeed, critics point to a number of unfulfilled pledges. Those roads and bridges he promised to repair or rebuild mostly were not. The coal industry has not been revived. And despite pledging to eliminate the U.S. national debt, on his watch, it's jumped from 19 to 27 trillion dollars. We are going to drain the swamp. Trump often said he'd improve government ethics. And while he's taken some steps on that, critics point to his own family now on staff at the White House and his own properties used to profit from government business. And yet. Trump supporters, many voting early for him right now, are correct when they say, hold on a second, he's kept plenty of promises. Chief among them, tilting the U.S. judiciary to the right. We are going to appoint justices of the United States Supreme Court who will uphold our laws and our Constitution. I, Amy Coney Barrett, not only has Trump now installed three staunch conservatives to the Supreme Court, he's also named some 200 others to lower level positions, reshaping the U.S. court system for generations. Conservatives love him for that. He did reduce taxes, including for corporations and small businesses, though it was the wealthy who benefited most. And NAFTA, as promised, was renegotiated. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, Asked how the talks played out. We could have done it a different way, but it would have been nasty and it wouldn't have been nice. And I don't want to have that. We have a great relationship with Canada. I think now it'll be better than ever. On top of that, as promised,
the U.S. will soon leave the Paris Climate Accord. The U.S. Embassy is now in Jerusalem. He did increase spending on the U.S. military, and if he didn't defeat ISIS under Trump, the terror group has weakened significantly. Extra controversially, as promised, Trump did restrict travel to America from certain Muslim-majority countries. All of it, a reminder that while Trump has his critics, those promises have tremendous appeal to all who support him, and he's kept a lot of it. I, Donald John Trump, will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend. The Still, it's another promise made as he took the oath of office that's now under the brightest spotlight to protect life and liberty, as it turns out, in the age of COVID. It's on that, say critics, he'll now be judged. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Well, up next, how new technology helped unveil a deep secret of the Great Barrier Reef, the massive structure scientists discovered, and what it can tell us about the past. Well, if you didn't think there were any more deep, dark secrets out there, this one is both. Australian scientists have found a new coral reef just off the northeastern tip of the country. It is an enormous structure, and thanks to new technology revealed in real time. Here's Greg Rasmussen. Look down, way down. We're just starting to come up the base of this, uh, this 500 meter reef. Mapping the seabed off the Australian coast, researchers came across a big surprise. A really big surprise. And nobody knew that this was here. If you imagine, if you took the Grand Canyon and added on the Niagara Falls times two, and then flooded that with seawater and stuck a coral reef on top. The newly discovered reef towers 500 meters off the sea floor, coming up to within just 40 meters of the surface. There's a whole lot of information locked up in these rocks that we can un uncover uh, back in the lab. It's millions of years old, layers of reef and other geological structures holding secrets from the past. A really remarkable landscape. It's like I have never seen such an amazing seafloor. The, the submarine canyons that are steeper and deeper here than any other part of the Great Barrier Reef. Researchers used this remotely operated vehicle, nicknamed Sebastian, to explore and gather samples hundreds of meters below the surface. Oh, ah, what's this? Is it a cone shell? shell? It's a cone shell and it's got its proboscis out. The research group funding the expedition will spend years analyzing what they've found. A lot of the waters we're diving on, it's the first time anyone's looked at these regions and we are finding all kinds of new things. With much of Australia's Great Barrier Reef dying due to climate change, scientists say studying this underwater seascape will help reveal what happened when oceans changed dramatically in the past. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. There's a bit of good news. Next on the National, Prince Rupert, BC, finds itself a new celebrity. The story behind this poor deer and why it's rising in fame. Next in our moment. Nope, you're not seeing things. This is a deer with a pink yoga ball stuck between its antlers. And it's getting some fame in Prince Rupert, BC. The story behind the new deer in town is our moment. Boyfriend went outside to let his dad's dog out and he called into the house and said, hey, come look at this deer. First, I kind of thought he said that the deer was playing with the ball. I come outside and I see this deer and a big pink ball stuck between its antlers. It took me by surprise. <laughs> the last one we seen was Hammy two and a half years ago. Someone just came across this deer with a big purple hammock in his antler. And so people, you know, started following Hammy and updating Facebook and saying, oh, this is where Hammy's at. And I got a good laugh out of it. And I just posted it on Facebook though to uh, give some people something to laugh about. I just think it's pretty funny and neat to see a deer like that. 
<laughs> so, so listen, it, it is certainly an unusual site. I, I will say, tragically, we, we don't have the answer to the most critical part of this, which is, is the ball still there, right? Uh, the, the hope right now, is, in particular from wildlife officials, is that it'll deflate on its own, but we don't know. Or is the deer embarrassed? Has it caught a glimpse of itself in, in the water somewhere and realized it? In a year where we're all trying to keep it on the rails, I mm. feel like I can relate to the disheveled nature of having a yoga ball Fair stuck enough. between your ends. Fair enough. That is a national for October 28th. Good night. Good night.